Welcome everyone to the 2021 NVCA VC Awards. I'm Bobby Franklin, President and CEO of the National Venture Capital Association, and will be your host for this virtual celebration. This format is certainly different from what we have put together in prior VC Awards ceremony. And many of you know, we used to get together at the gala event in San Francisco every spring. But as the pandemic continues to keep us from hosting in-person events, we are so thankful that we are still able to celebrate the leaders and rising stars that represent our incredible and resilient industry, even in a virtual setting. We're going to kick off this event with a fireside chat with Moderna CEO, Stefan Bonsell, and then we will transition into our VC Awards ceremony video, where we will hear from all of our award winners and our sponsors. So without further ado, let me introduce Stefan Bonsell, CEO of Moderna, the innovative pharmaceutical and biotechnology company that has been on the front lines of combating COVID-19 with their development of the life-changing vaccine. Moderna has certainly become a household name throughout the past year, as we have all been living through the effects from COVID-19. It's an honor and a real pleasure to have Stefan here with me today. Stefan, thank you for being here. Well, Bobby, thank you so much for having us. And you know, I should mention, here we are on a Zoom platform, which was venture-backed talking to a CEO of a venture-backed company. So if that's not proof of the importance of the venture capital industry, I don't know what is. Exactly. So Stefan, you obviously, you weren't born and raised here in the United States. You, you were born and raised in France. I would love for you to tell the audience first about what led you to come to the United States in the first place. Sure. I mean, it all started because, you know, I was born in 72. So I grew up with computers and coding, you know, I got, you know, Texas Instrument and coding in basic and then an Apple IIc and coding again. So I really fell in love with technology, you know, at a young age. Uh, and I think all the, the companies that were growing up in Silicon Valley were really like an example of, you know, entrepreneurship and, and technology and the impact on the world. That was extremely inspiring uh, to me. Uh, and at the time, I thought I was going to go into the tech world. Um, and when I was studying in France, you know, in college, I actually stumbled on biology by accident. I used to hate biology in high school because I could not understand a thing. Uh, but then when I go to college, I'm studying engineering. I love chemistry. Chemistry leads me into biochemistry, leads me into genetics. I love genetics and come back to biology. We are studying genetics. Uh, and so I decided to come to the U.S. to get a, a master's of science in biochemical engineering. Uh, I went to Minnesota because we had one of the best programs in the country. And unlike MIT and Stanford, those free schools are always competing for the top spot in biochemical engineering. Uh, it was much cheaper, like half the price of MIT or Stanford. So as a, as a guy who didn't want to take any debt and didn't want my parents to pay for it, uh, I went to Minnesota. After that, I went to Japan where I worked for a diagnostic company, so life science company integrating, you know, machine and software and biology for doing clinical diagnostic. Then came back to the US to get an MBA. Uh, as a European, I thought it made no sense for me to get an MBA in Europe, but you no know, the country of business is this country. Uh, and so I was lucky enough to get into Harvard Business School where I studied for two years. And I graduated, you know, in May 2000. And as everybody remembers, or a lot of people remember, uh, during you know, the, my second year in school, when we were looking for jobs, you know, the NASDAQ was going through the roof and the entire class was going to the tech world, uh, you know, starting dot-coms or joining dot-coms. And I like to be a contrarian. So I say, okay, I'm gonna stay in life science because nobody's going there. And I, I worked at Eli Lilly because I'm like, you know, I worked for a small company before B school. Let me learn about a big company, but just to look what it looks like as a big company. So I worked for Eli Lilly in the UK and then in Indianapolis, and then in Belgium as a country manager. And then I got uh, recruited by Biomario again, but this time to be CEO. So it was a, a big, crazy uh, job offer I got because I was 33 years old at the time. I, I was going to say, you had to be really young when you got that offer. Yeah, I was 33 years old. Uh, I was super scared <laughs> about uh, messing it up. Uh, so I ran the company five years, two years out of France, because it's a French headquartered company. It's a global company you know, in 40 countries. Um, at the time, 6,000 people, I think now they're close to 10,000 people. 
Um, but because I was in the US all the time, because Biomer had a fantastic commercial network. And so I was looking for, you know, technology companies to acquire or partner with. And so, you know, like you guys do for portfolio in the VC world or the asset management world, we look at a lot of companies. We bought 10 companies in five years. And so I started to talk to all the key VCs uh, and being in the US all the time, I then after two years moved the family to Boston uh, because I was more in the US than I was in France. And so my wife is like, why am I in France again? Um, <laughs> and so we moved the family to Boston and there I was, you know, spending a lot of time with uh, the team at Flagship, the team, you know, at a couple of the best VCs in Boston, looking at companies they had as well as in the Valley. And something very strange started to happen that I didn't plan for, which is VCs, you know, decided to propose me to join the companies in their portfolios to run them. And, you know, most, most companies in biotech were a typical biotech company with one drug. And because I'm not a gambling guy, it was always, thank you very much, but no, thank you. Uh, until one day, Nuba Afeyan, who, as many of you know, uh, you know, leads flagship and started flagship, um, called me and he's like, where are you? And I'm like, I'm in Boston, why? He's like, well, you need to come to my office tonight. And so I go to his office and he describes to me the company they wanted to create, Moderna. We at the time at one scientist, still at flagship, and I think they had put a series A of like $1.5 million, like very tiny. Um, and he's like, why don't you, you find a way to join this company? So th now that must have been, was that what year? Is that like 2010? Uh, February 2011. So we started the company in 2010. Okay. And trying to figure out what do they do with the company, how do they start it, how do they build it. And I talked to them, I think around February or January 2011. Okay. Uh, where at the time there was just one scientist. Wow. So you you get called by Nubar. He talks to you about what they have going and what they have, they're thinking about at flagship. Talk about kind of building Moderna just 10 years ago. I mean, I sort of am interested in not only the how, but, but sort of the why. Sure. So the piece that's important to understand about Moderna and try to go into a time machine back to, you know, the early days where there was nothing, just this kind of crazy idea. And by the way, the first time Nubar told me he was going to make drugs out of mRNA in people's body, I told him, dude, this is never going to work. You're crazy. <laughs> um, Clearly, I got convinced that this might work and decided to join. Uh, but the piece that's important to know about Moderna is from the beginning, we said this is an information molecule. And the industry in biotech and pharma has never seen an information molecule. If you think about pharma and biotech, it's typically with small molecule or recombinant, an, an analog world where every drug is different. But here we said, if we can find a way to make mRNA work safely in human, which was a huge if at the time, of course, we could make, you know, hundreds of products that nobody can make. Those products will have a much higher probability of success because it's always the same four letters, just a different orders, like, you know, software. Uh, life is coded, as, as everybody knows, now with four letters. Um, if we were to invest in process development and IT and robotics, which is why my background as a chemical engineer with big pharma experience in, in manufacturing and IT and robotics was handy. Uh, I said, look, if we really invest aggressively early in process development, scale up robotics and IT, the speed at which the drugs could move from somebody's brain to a computer, to a robot, to a human would be crazy. Um, and, and then I had forgotten how you make mRNA because I've been out of you know, grad school for a while. So I asked Nuba, who is also a chemi. I said, hey, how do you make mRNA again? And he told me, oh, as a chemi, you will get a kick out of it. It's liquid phase, you know, cell-free enzymatic reaction in water. I'm like, oh shit, it's gonna be super cheap uh, and super scalable. He's like, yes, it's gonna be super cheap and super scalable. And so what is important to know is because of this incredible impact on, on humanity this could have over time. And we're talking about 10, 20, 30 years, not six months, of course. Uh, we thought this could be a new class of medicine, like recombinant transforms small molecule, you know, 50 years ago when VC funded, you know, Genentech and Amgen started the biotech revolution. And so we use that a lot in terms of how to think about it, not in terms of looking at two years, but looking at 10, 20, 30 years and what this has become, as we all know, you know, seven of the top 10 drugs right now uh, in the world uh, sold are, you know, biotech products, uh, even though many of those are hidden in big pharma. And so 
so this long-term uh, mindset of a new class of medicine and this realization that because mRNA was information, we were either going to go bankrupt because we're going to run out of cash before we launch a product, or this company would be gigantic if we you know, had the right strategic framework, if we executed well. But there was no in-between. Like, it made no scientific sense this would be a one or two drug company. And so we say, OK, we're not going to build a company assuming failure. So it actually made us very easy for us to say, OK, we need to build for massive scale. And if we are wrong, well, we'll be wrong. Um, and so when you look even at how we f thought about funding, you know, we you know, raised a $500 million you know, private round back in 2014, which had never happened in biotech before. The biggest round before us, I think, was $200 million for a phase three company. We were still preclinical. We had zero human data. And so that is how we build the company, which is always to say, OK, how do we build the best version of Moderna? How do we build a portfolio to manage risk? And, and to reduce risk, both on technology risk around mRNA and on biology risk in terms of disease understanding. And so that's why we, we went with a 16 you know, drug in development at the time. Now we have 24 uh, pipeline into the clinic. And everybody said they're crazy. And we did that to actually reduce technology and biology risk. But we increased tremendously financing risk because you had to fund all those products and execution risk because you had to make sure you could run the company that was building the plane while you were flying it with all those products at the same time. Wow. So you, you started 10 years ago. You had a couple of huge fundraising rounds. You had this idea, this platform using messenger RNA to, to be able to, to come up with what is, is necessary. So I guess my question, you mentioned there that you have, did you say 24? Drugs in the in the pipeline? We had 16 at the time of the IPO. We have now 24, yeah. Okay, 16 at IPO, 24 now. So what can you tell us about those 24 drugs? In other words, I assume they're not all vaccines. They must be doing other things, right? So tell us kind of the different categories and the different things that you hope to, to create here. Yeah, so of course, we have a few more vaccines. You know, we had been doing vaccines for now five years in the clinic and the COVID vaccine that you know, made national news when we put it in the clinic with Dr. Fauci on March 16 last year was actually our 10th vaccine in humans. Um, but what is really cool about mRNA is we're applying it to a lot of disease areas. You know, we have five drugs in the clinic in cancer, all in immuno-oncology, all combined with a commercial checkpoint with the same thesis is can you increase the response of a checkpoint monotherapy by doing something totally orthogonal by adding mRNA. Um, some is injected directly into tumors, uh, and some is actually a personalized cancer vaccine where we make a different product for every human being based on a full genome sequencing of their tumor cells from a biopsy compared to the mutation in their uh, uh, healthy cells, all done in the cloud and so on. So we build basically a robot that can do in a few weeks uh, drugs for one human being at a time. Um, so that has been a super cool project. Now, let me, let me stop you there. You said for one human being in a few weeks. Yeah. Now, talk about the vaccine just for a second. I know we're not going to talk a lot about the vaccine, but for the vaccine, how long did it take when you got the, the sequence that was uh, posted by China? So it took us two days to do the vaccine design. So for the scientists to look at the vaccine protein to do freedom, two days. So two days of research. If you think about it in traditional timelines, we did two days of research, all in silico. We never had access to a physical virus. And, uh, and then it took another 40 days to make the clinical grade product, which we shipped to the NIH for Dr. Fauci to start the phase one. Uh, and recently, we did that all over again, almost to the day uh, for the South Africa variant, just to be ready in case a boost is needed in the fall. Um, and that one took 30 days from sequence and decisions to shipping the, the QC approved product. Wow. Okay, so <clears throat> that's vaccines you're talking about. I mean, how could you be more personalized in personalized medicine than looking at an individual and sort of understanding what is ailing them, maybe what cancer, what, what you have you, and be able to come up with something. And you said two weeks? Yeah. And, and then the other piece, to continue your question on, on what else we are doing, we're working in cardiology. We have a super cool drug in phase two, which I believe has a very high chance of working. Uh, 
the, the in cardiology. So the data have been published in Pig. They look fantastic. Uh, the phase one uh, the safety was pristine, and we saw that the mRNA made the protein of interest and the protein was active in human. That was shown in the phase one. Now we need to show the real test is injected in people's heart. So this program uh, is the following. The idea is to inject that product as a one-time intervention after a heart attack. Because as many people know, if you survive a heart attack, you will most probably die of a heart failure if you don't die of something else before. Uh, because your heart muscle is so damaged during the infarct. And so the idea here is to inject mRNA coding for human VEGF uh, to revascularize, to grow new blood vessel in your heart after an MI. The data in, in pigs looks fantastic. And as many know, you know, the pig is the best model for kind of cardiac type of uh, physical event. And we've shown in pigs and AZ published that data showing that there was a massive imp improvement in ejection fraction, the ability of the heart to pump blood. Uh, that's very significant from a clinical standpoint from you know, living between your bed and your TV couch and back and forth, having no life to being able to, to have a normal heart function again. So that's in the phase two right now. AZ is running it, it's placebo control. Uh, it's not impossible, we'll get the data this year. Uh, we're also in rare genetic disease where we're trying to attack disease that cannot be drugged using recombinant or small molecule by getting mRNA inside cells that require a protein that is missing from those kids that have, you know, uh, the, the bad genetic information from mom and dad uh, to basically restore the function of a protein. So we have uh, four or five programs there. And the last area where we started uh, last year is autoimmune disease. We think there's very cool things we can do in autoimmune disease to restore homeostasis of your body um, in a way that same cannot be done using recombinant or small molecule. We have a very cool drug that basically gets the mRNA through a formulation we developed into uh, immune cells to rebalance your immune system. So this should be in the clinic this year. So uh, yeah, this year is gonna be a very fun year to watch most probably oncology data, cardiology data, rare disease data, and autoimmune disease data. Because as you know, most people think Moderna is, an, is a COVID-19 vaccine company. And I'm trying to remind them that no, Moderna is an amazing, <laughs> very broad platform. We just happen to have a very high efficacy COVID-19 vaccine. I mean, it, it sounds to me what you're saying is that not only, you know, the world knows you for COVID-19, obviously, but you have all of these things that are very close to, to coming out. And as you said, COVID-19 was your 10th vaccine. So it's not like it was just the first, even though the company is only 10 years old. So you, you have all of these things in the pipeline. Is there something that you sort of imagine on the horizon that if we were having this conversation in, I don't know, two or three years from now, something else that you hope the company gets to tackle? Yes, yeah, so we are working on two things. Uh, one is delivering to the lung via an aerosol. We're working on that with Vertex. Uh, it's making very good progress. It's still in the labs. It's still not in the clinic, but it's starting to smell really good. Vertex has kind of paid a couple of milestones uh, and, and doubled down because they are really happy with where we are and the, and the velocity of that, of that program. So I really hope we can get uh, this into the clinic soon, because if we know how to get mRNA via an aerosol into the clinic for cystic fibrosis, you can use that for a lot of other disease in the lung. Um, so that, that would be super cool. The other piece too, we are making our baby step into gene editing. As you guys know, you know, there's been a lot of things written about gene editing and the CRISPR technology and so on. Well, if you think about it, CRISPR, you use enzyme to edit genes. Enzymes are protein. Well, with mRNA, we can code for any protein we want. So once Moderna is becoming really more of a company able to deliver nucleic acid into the right cells, if you think about it through you know, gene therapy, RNAi, uh, gene editing, the challenge has always been delivery. Well, given the scale of Moderna, you know, we have the biggest genomics company in the world, if you think about it, in terms of treatment. Um, we have invested around two thirds of our capital in science in the last few years all around delivery. And so now to start to apply that outside mRNA or using mRNA to make enzyme to do gene editing or base editing is a natural extension that we started to do with our first baby step with Vertex, again for CF. So we have two projects in the lung. One is mRNA making the CF protein directly. The one is mRNA coding for the enzyme to go do the gene editing into the lung cells. 
And so you can start to see how Moderna is going to keep expanding our horizon. You know, we always think about how do we grow 10x from where we are. The cool thing about Moderna today is that if you think about the, the big pivot that has happened to us is last year, you know, we believed mRNA could get approved. Now we know mRNA can get approved. Uh, we were a cash flow negative company. Now we have been cash flow positive in Q3 and Q4. And we're always not keeping a lot of cash to manage runaway, like any you know, responsible <laughs> startup uh, because of financing risk and the capital market risk. That always impacts you know, the mood in the private market, as you all know. And so we used to run the company with two to three years of cash, but now we have cash flow coming every month. So we don't need that pile of cash and the pile of cash has grown extraordinarily. I mean, we had $5 billion of cash, no debt at the end of the year, and we're still going up as we speak. Uh, and so we are using this, this time now uh, about asking the question to the team, is like, okay, how do we grow 10X from here? Where do we focus in terms of more drugs? How do we focus in terms of more areas? So the two areas I would be very excited to see in a couple of years to your question will be is delivering to the lung as well as all the things we're already doing and many more programs in each of those applications I mentioned and uh, some serious impact ideally in the clinic with gene editing as well. Wow. Well, Stefan, when I told folks I was going to have the opportunity to talk to you today, I can't tell you how many people, my parents and others said, please thank him because they have the Moderna vaccine now. It gives them hope to get through this pandemic. So on behalf of them, I want to thank you for spending time with us today. On behalf of NBCA and, and all of our members, thank you for what you do. Uh, I appreciate the, the risk and the bold vision that you all had in creating Moderna out of a venture capital firm and all the success you've had. And just to give us a glimpse of what the future may hold is so exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. And again, thank you for everything that you all guys do. Uh, this, this country is the best country in the world to invest in innovation, to take risk. Uh, and that's how we're going to get the, the planet to be a better place. Uh, thankfully, you know, 10 years ago, people took a bet on, on this technology when everybody thought it was crazy. Many people in the press you know, called us names, including you know, saying this was you know, not even real and we are faking it and so on. Uh, and thankfully, we were ready when, when the virus hit last year. So thank you for all the companies you guys are helping and investing and building right now, because in three, five, ten years, they might have a big impact on the world as well to make it a better place. So thank you. Well, what you just said suggests to us at NVCA that you would be a great candidate for us to take up to Capitol Hill and talk about the many issues that help the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Again, Stefan, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, everybody, and stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye. That was fantastic. So now we're going to begin our VC Awards ceremony portion of the event. And in a minute here, I'm going to play our ceremony video. This video will also be available on our website and email to our NVCA membership so that you're able to share it with your colleagues, family members, and friends. So let's begin and enjoy. Hi, and welcome to the 2021 VC Awards Virtual Ceremony. I'm Bobby Franklin, President and CEO of the National Venture Capital Association, the industry's trade association here in Washington, D.C., representing the interest of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. We're thrilled that you've joined us today. And first, I'd like to begin, like all events, in thanking our sponsors. We couldn't do this without the support of our wonderful industry sponsors. And this event is being sponsored by Silicon Valley Bank, EY, Citi, Morgan Stanley, and American Express. Thank you to the support you provide to us. I'd also like to share that this year we've added three new awards. There are now nine awards that we look forward to handing out each and every year. The three new awards are the Startup Champion, which you'll hear more about, as well as the Startup Innovator, and the DEI Impact Award. 
all very important to show who are the leaders in our industry and those that help our industry. You know, last summer we launched Venture Forward. It's a 501c3 organization and its purpose and mission is really to help the industry become a better version of itself. Everything from education, research, working on diversity, even making sure we capture the rich history of this young industry and its players. You can learn more by going to ventureforward.org. And while you're there, feel free to make a donation. It operates under the support of people like you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce this year's chairman of the board for NVCA, Barry Eggers with Lightspeed Venture Partners. Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bobby. As Bobby mentioned, I'm Barry Eggers, chairman of the National Venture Capital Association and co-founder of Lightspeed Venture Partners. I'm delighted to be with you all as we celebrate the 2021 NVCA VC Award winners. At the risk of stating the obvious, it's been an interesting year to be chairman, or rather virtual chairman of the NVCA. It's not worth recounting a year many would like to forget. But amidst the chaos, the innovation economy emerged as a source of hope. As many of you can attest to, the venture capital and startup ecosystem is responsible for creating the companies and opportunities that we hope will build a better tomorrow. And it became abundantly clear during 2020 that we not only need the innovation economy to shift into high gear, but we need it to work for everyone. Right now, against this backdrop, I think it's important to take a moment to applaud the work that individuals, firms, companies, and policymakers have done to strengthen the U.S. economy, to provide answers to the world's most challenging questions, and to bring together the best minds so that, that there is hope for a brighter, safer, innovative, and inclusive future. Thank you, Barry, and thank you to the NBCA. My name is Rob Freeland, and I'm head of Venture Capital Relationships at Silicon Valley Bank. Today is a fun day. Today we gather to celebrate standout individuals and firms for their positive impacts on the venture community. Silicon Valley Bank was founded nearly 40 years ago by a few entrepreneurial bankers who believed that helping venture capitalists support their innovative portfolio companies would spark positive change in our Silicon Valley community. Looking back on 2020, it was a year of stark contrasts. Venture has reached nearly every corner of the globe and every community of ours was deeply affected by the pandemic. And yet, venture capital has produced near record levels of liquidity, company investments, funds, and dollars raised. Despite the headwinds, there is much to celebrate today. Congratulations to all the winners. SVB looks forward to continuing our work alongside you and the NBCA. Our first award of the day is the Startup Champion Award. This Startup Champion Award recognizes elected officials for their significant contributions to advancing public policy that supports the entrepreneurial ecosystem and creates a more positive environment for new company formation here in America. This is the first year we are giving this award. Now, longtime NVCA members may recall we used to give the Steiger Award in recognition of former Congressman William Steiger. We believe the time is right to once again recognize those policymakers who support our advocacy efforts. And we are proud to give this award to a Republican and a Democrat, to Representatives Patrick McHenry and Representative Dean Phillips. First up is Congressman Patrick McHenry of North Carolina. Representative McHenry is likely known to many of you and that's a big reason why we are giving him the award today. We often talk about how DC is a big company town and that policymakers spend most of their time hearing from big corporations. At NVCA, we spend an incredible amount of time encouraging policymakers to think about those young companies that venture capitalists back, usually against all odds. Too often our voice is overpowered by the larger players, but every so often, a member of Congress steps forward who truly appreciates why startups are so important. Patrick McHenry is one of those members. Some of you have met Mr. McHenry as he has traveled to places like Silicon Valley 
to get to know the entrepreneurial ecosystem and has been a vocal proponent of innovation. Others of you have seen Mr. McHenry at VCs to DC, where he delivered a keynote address for us a few years ago. And I remember our members thinking about how he truly gets what VC does and why it's so important after his talk. Or perhaps you've seen him in his efforts on the Financial Services Committee, where he is the top Republican. In that post, he has worked with NVCA on issues like CFIUS reform to ensure passive investment in venture funds is not caught up in a time-consuming and costly regulatory process. The Paycheck Protection Program, to make sure regulators were hearing about how VC-backed companies were structured so that they were not disadvantaged for the help that Congress was set to give. The beneficial ownership legislation, where he was a key player in pushing back on onerous requirements for startups, or his constant drumbeat of support for capital formation. Please now welcome Congressman Patrick McHenry. Hello, friends. This is Congressman Patrick McHenry, a ranking member of the House Financial Services Committee. I want to start by thanking you for selecting me to receive NVCA's first ever Startup Champion Award. It's fostering innovation and technology has been a priority of mine since coming to Congress. Uh, Washington has the unfortunate knee-jerk reaction uh, to deter something simply because they don't understand it. We've seen this time and time again as new technologies come online and lawmakers rush to overregulate or worse, kill it. That is not the right approach. Our default answer should be yes to private sector innovation. Last Congress, I reintroduced the Financial Services Innovation Act to modernize our regulatory framework to ensure that financial institutions and entrepreneurs can go to market sooner with innovative products. I believe this is a necessary step toward creating a regulatory process that works with innovators rather than against innovators. Our entrepreneurs and capital markets are, are what make us uh, the greatest economy in the world. We should be working to drive com uh, company formation, not just for these great job creators, but also to expand investment opportunities for everyday investors. Uh, your members are the leaders in this space, providing the necessary capital for startups. And for that, I am quite grateful. We in Washington should follow suit and work to make it easier for startups to find investors and raise capital, including uh, enhancing my bill, uh, which allows crowdfunding, uh, investment crowdfunding, uh, which we were able to pass through the House of Representatives and, and uh, put corrective measures through the Securities Exchange Commission as well. Investment crowdfunding can help support what you do uh, in the venture capital world. And as we work to recover uh, from this economic crisis born out of the COVID pandemic, we'll need innovative solutions like these to build our Main Street businesses. Organizations like yours uh, are leading the way in advocating for 21st century solutions uh, that play a critical role in shifting the mindset here in Washington, D.C. We must continue to work hand in hand to support our entrepreneurs, innovators, and small businesses and their workers. Thank you for what you do, and I look forward to continuing to work with you, hopefully, hopefully in person soon. So thank you again for this uh, great honor, and uh, I'm so grateful, uh, and I just want to say thank you again. Take care. Our other Startup Champion Award winner is Representative Dean Phillips. He has quickly become a powerful champion for America's startups. As you all know, the outset of the COVID pandemic was particularly chaotic. It's times like these that let us know who is really there for the startup ecosystem. And that's what we saw in Representative Dean Phillips, a first time congressman who put his political capital on the line for startups and growth companies across the country. When we were in the middle of the debate with the administration on affiliation rules for the Paycheck Protection Program, Congressman Phillips led a bipartisan letter of 54 members of Congress to the administration calling on them to fix the affiliation rules. It's hard to get 54 bipartisan members of Congress to agree on what color the sky is at any given moment. Yet the congressman rallied them to our cause. And for that, we are grateful. And then as focus turned on what's next, 
Congressman Phillips designed a program that actually fits the growth company model. He wrote the Ignite American Innovation Act, a bill that would accelerate job creation and innovation by allowing startups and growth companies to monetize up to $25 million in tax assets. As is his hallmark, he is doing this on a bipartisan basis. Congressman, congratulations on this well-deserved recognition. Hi everybody, it's Dean Phillips from Minnesota's 3rd Congressional District. I am so humbled and grateful to be named a startup champion by the NVCA and want to say thank you to everybody. As a business owner and a startup alum myself, the award is particularly meaningful to me and I could not be more appreciative. As most of you know, 80% of all venture capital investment, that's right, 80% flows to just three urban areas on our country's coasts. That means communities like mine in Minnesota, filled with so many wonderful thinkers and innovators and entrepreneurs, is often overlooked and underserved. That's why I've made it one of my personal missions to support startup businesses generally and ensure that all entrepreneurs around the country, regardless of their zip codes, have access to the capital and resources they need. Broadening access to capital will help entrepreneurship, drive growth, and turbocharge our economic recovery post-pandemic. And I'm not alone in this effort. There's broad, bipartisan, and growing support for our nation's emerging businesses. It's a fact that both energizes and inspires me. In fact, in this past Congress, I was the proud author of a couple of bills, like the New Business Preservation Act and the Ignite American Innovation Act, which would be a lifeline to promising startups and entrepreneurs all across the country, all of which have steadfast support with both Democratic and Republican colleagues. But these steps represent just a beginning, not an end, and the urgency of our work has never been greater. The Great Recession did severe and lasting damage to American entrepreneurship, we all know that. And we cannot and must not allow COVID-19 to do the same thing. In the year to come, I promise to advocate for startups and be a voice for America's innovators, both through my work on the Small Business Committee, to which I was just named, and as a vice chair of the Bipartisan Problem Solvers, 58 Democrats and Republicans committed to working together. And like every good entrepreneur, I am optimistic for the future, but I know that we cannot achieve our potential without a lot of hard work. So as we emerge from the greatest economic and health crisis of our lifetimes, I wanna say thank you. I'm grateful to have you on my side and so excited that I won't have to do all this work alone. So thank you again from the bottom of my heart for this great honor. Keep the faith and remember that optimism is a whole lot more powerful than fear. Thanks everybody. Hello everyone, I'm Sunita Patel and I lead the business development organization at Silicon Valley Bank. At SVP, we believe that a truly high-performing environment requires diversity in talent, thinking, culture, and employees. Every day, our team is actively committed to creating an environment for the underrepresented to thrive, both at SVP and in the greater innovation economy. That being said, it's my honor to present MVCA's inaugural DEI Impact Award. This award recognizes an organization who has made significant strides toward advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive venture ecosystem and has also provided meaningful opportunities for underrepresented individuals in our industry. Please join me in congratulating this year's first. DEI Impact Award winner, Black VC. Accepting the award on behalf of the Black VC team are founders Sydney Sykes and Frederick Gross. Thank you so much to the NVCA for giving us this award. This has been an incredible year and none of it would have been possible without the support of our allies, our supporters, and especially our volunteers. So thank you all so much. We're looking forward to working with you in 2021. Fred and I started Black VC in 2017 because we saw an industry that was incredibly influential and impactful in the US that Black communities were being left out of. We thought that not only for Black communities, but also for the entire industry, this country would be better off if an organization like Black VC were there to empower Black investors and increase diversity in venture capital. We've come a long way since we started the organization, but there's still so far to come, and we're excited to have an organization like the NVCA supporting us. 
2020 was a watershed moment for us as an organization. And quite frankly, it was a watershed moment for us as a country. You know, it was really, I think, the first time in a massive scale where we all started to reflect purposefully on the, the access that Black individuals and Black bodies had in corporate America and in business. And that conversation extended to tech and venture capital. And we've been honored to be one of the groups helping steward that conversation in our industry. Now, 2020, as that acknowledgement and awareness built, also provided an opportunity for us as an organization to build and launch programs. And these programs are our attempt to build structural solutions to the structural problems we've seen exist and continue to exist in the industry and a lot of corporate, corporate industries as well. Now, for us, what those programs were was a program to help people actually get jobs in venture at a program that we call Breaking Into Venture. And then a program called the Black Venture Institute, which was a targeted attempt at making sure that we're driving and building connections with the Black uh, technology uh, uh, employees across all of corporate America and the, t the tech and venture ecosystems that we all live and work in. And building these ties, we believe, are going to be fundamentally important to ensuring that we provide easier access for the next generation of Black founders as they emerge throughout the different organizations they're currently within. But this is just the beginning, and we're going to need a lot more help and support and attention. And while City and I and all of the leadership of Black VC have been just thrilled to see the support that has come in over the last year uh, and years that we've been running, we know that there is just so much more work that needs to be done. And the good news here is with the collective attention and desire to make the change, that change can indeed happen. And we're beginning to see that happen already. And so we are just thrilled and excited and, and have any just a complete sense of gratitude to the NVCA for creating the space and awarding us this incredible honor. And we are excited to continue to partner with you and many other organizations out there as we look forward into 2021 and the next five years, 10 years and decades ahead. Thank you. And now I'm happy to announce the winner of the Startup Innovator Award. This award is a new category for 2021, and it goes to a VC or growth equity backed portfolio company for its significant contributions to society and the world. Companies receiving this award have made a positive and measurable impact on addressing an area of need, an ongoing crisis, or a significant challenge that exists in our world. The company's dedication to affecting positive change has made it a leader, within the entrepreneurial ecosystem around the problem it seeks to address. Considering the current pandemic and the devastating effects it had on people's lives and the global economy, I'm honored to take this moment to present this award to Pneumotix. Pneumotix, whose team has brought a glimmer of hope to all of us during this trying time. When COVID-19 hit the country and the world, Michigan-based Pneumotix jumped into action, quickly receiving emergency authorization from the FDA for its COVID-19 tests and rapidly putting their test into the field. Since March, Pneumotix has sold over three and a half million COVID tests worldwide with a 99.5% accuracy in real world data. They've also developed a saliva-based test for COVID that is approved worldwide. Finally, they've developed a test to help distinguish between COVID and flu-like illnesses. It has approval abroad, and it is in the final stages of approval with the FDA here in the United States. Pneumotix is an amazing example of what a nimble, passionate, VC-backed company can do in the face of a global health crisis. Thank you, Pneumotix, for your amazing work, and congratulations on receiving this award in its inaugural year. My name is Jeff Williams. I was the founder, chairman, and CEO of Pneumotix Molecular, an in vitro diagnostic company that was started about 10 years ago to develop a more automated and easy to use system for automating PCR, a technology used for detecting DNA and RNA. While pneumotics manufactures and sells tests for many different infectious diseases, such as HIV and hepatitis, we had no idea when we started the company that we would play an important role in a pandemic. 
The team at Nomotics did a fantastic job designing and developing a COVID-19 test that gained emergency use authorizations in US, Europe, and many countries around the world. The pneumotics test provides high sensitivity COVID-19 results in about 80 minutes from a fully automated high throughput system. Thank you to all the pneumotics employees who made this possible and thank you to the National Venture Capital Association for this prestigious award. Our next award is our Outstanding Service Award. The Outstanding Service Award recognizes the exceptional service of an NVCA director or NVCA member who has committed an extraordinary amount of time, resources, and dedication to association efforts that in turn benefits the entire venture industry. The dedication has raised the visibility of the industry to key legislators and regulators and helped educate them regarding the pivotal role of venture capital to this economy. This award is particularly near and dear to my heart because, because it always goes to an NVCA member who's greatly helped me and the team here at NVCA as well as the entire industry with their dedication. I'm happy to announce and bestow this honor on one of NBCA's most active advocates, Mr. Aziz Galani with the Mercury Fund. When COVID-19 first hit, Congress began putting together programs to help people and small businesses survive the economic effects of the pandemic. The most important program for VC-backed companies was the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, as it came to be known. But in its original drafted form, most startups would not have been eligible for PPP. And it was Aziz Galani who was instrumental in helping NVCA identify the problems with how PPP was originally written and helping us find solutions so that the program could work for startups. The fact that hundreds of startups were able to access PPP to keep employees and in some cases stay in business would not have been possible without Aziz Galani's hard work and dedication on behalf of the industry. Aziz, congratulations on this award. Thanks, Bobby. And thank you, NVCA, for this wonderful award. This year, I got to see the National Venture Capital Association's entire staff work hard on a number of initiatives and had the pleasure of working closely with a few key staff members to make a lot of positive changes happen for our industry. First, I want to talk about Justin Field and the entire NVCA policy team. The CARES Act and PPP working with our portfolio companies was a major boon that helped us survive this pandemic stronger as an industry. Getting PPP to work with our portfolio companies took a lot of very hard work. I remember being on the phone with Justin Field late at night, many, many evenings. First, we had to work through Congress, then we had to work through the SBA, then through Treasury, then, after all the rules got set, we had to convince the venture banks to work with us, and we had to get our portfolio companies and our legal representation to give the practical advice we needed in order to get our portfolio companies the assistance that they needed. Working together, we were able to help our portfolio companies keep people employed during this terrible pandemic and talk about something we should all be eternally thankful for. I also got to see VC University hard at work, both in person and then virtually through the efforts of Mariam Huck. We were able to continue training the next generation of venture capital leaders um, in crazy circumstances. Also, they got to pilot a brand new mentorship program that me and my partners were able to participate in. This was incredible experiences for both the mentors and the mentees as we got to see the next generation of leadership. We also got to see Stephanie Voke expand the footprint of the VCs that the NVCA traditionally works with through a new pricing scheme that allows for venture capital firms with less assets under management in the middle of the country, something that us at Mercury Fund based in Texas care deeply about, um, be able to participate in NVCA membership and other activities. Last, I wanna talk about Jan Frankel, who allowed me to walk the halls of Congress with her as we advocated for NBCA policy decisions. 
This is just a fraction of what the NVCA does. And I'm very heartened to have been able to participate in a number of these activities. I couldn't do any of this without the help of my partners at Mercury Fund. Blair Garou, Adrian Fortino, Dan Watkins, Heath Butler, and Samantha Jeff Lewis have all been extremely helpful over the course of the last year and gave me the flexibility to work closely with the NBCA. In addition to that, the CEOs had to put up with a lot. I sent them so many emails about PPP, racial justice, and a number of timely issues that us getting on top of helped their portfolio companies do better. Last, I also want to thank the folks over at Rice University, where I teach venture capital, um, for being supportive of my outside advocacy activities. Thank you for all of that. Finally, I want to take a moment to talk about the family structure that gives me the flexibility to do all of this. I'll start with my mom, start with Kalani, Hazin Khan, Sanya Rahim, Faraz Rahim, Sandra Medina, and even my kids' schools. I'm on the road all the time. And none of that is possible without that strong structure giving me the freedom to advocate for and volunteer for the industry that I love. Thank you, everybody, for making all of this possible. And let's make next year even better for our industry. Up next is NVCA's American Spirit Award. The American Spirit Award recognizes NVCA members who have shown philanthropic leadership by applying business skills, knowledge, expertise and resources to make an outstanding contribution to society. I think all of you would agree with me when I say that I can't think of anyone better to receive this award this year other than Kate Mitchell. Kate is heavily involved in the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. She's a charter member of Environmental Entrepreneurs. She's a mentor to Kaufman Fellows and close to home, Kate is a significant donor to Venture Forward, NVCA's supporting nonprofit that is driving the human capital, culture, values, and narrative of the venture capital industry. Kate's a former board chair of NVCA and has the distinction of serving on the board twice. She's already received the Outstanding Service Award from NVCA for her work on the JOBS Act. Kate, we're kind of running out of awards to give you. But I know you certainly deserve the American Spirit Award, and I'm honored to present it to you. Congratulations. Thank you, Bobby, and to the MVCA team. Um, for those of you I haven't met, I am Kate Mitchell, co-founder of Scale Venture Partners. We're an early stage enterprise software investor in companies uh, from DocuSign to current leaders like JFrog and WalkMe. The way I invest my personal time is to pave the way for others to have the kind of opportunity I've been really fortunate to have. And uh, so therefore, as a former chairman of the NBCA and a very proud board member of NBCA's Venture Forward, I am honored to receive the of NBCA's American Spirit Award. It's funny, I, I think back seven years ago, Ashton Newhall and I, then both NBCA board members, founded a start of task force um, to look at, at the issues of, of the diversity in our industry. And that's now grown into Venture Forward. For those of you that don't know, it's a nonprofit and a supporting foundation of the NBCA. The, the purpose of Venture Forward is to help the next generation of venture capitalists succeed. Our focus is to expand and change the, the diversity in our industry. And by that, we mean race, gender, and geography, geography uh, to get uh, access to venture in communities that, that don't, aren't exposed to it now and don't have inroads now. We put a thousand students through Venture Capital University. We have scholarships focused on underrepresented communities and have an active, men active mentoring program between really experienced uh, venture capitalists, many board members of the MVCA and, and the next generation. Um, our goal is to open doors. Um, not just, by the way, though, for those next generation leaders, but to our industry um, so that we can have continued growth for decades to come. As Kirsten Green, a forerunner, um, puts it, uh, practice venture with intention. We can bring balance to our industry and we can bring uh, add value to our portfolios. Um, so I first want to thank some of my favorite entrepreneurs who are the 
team, the full-time team that works on Venture Forward, Miriam Hawk, Renan Anderson, and Michael Chow, um, and to our sponsors, Silicon Valley Bank, uh, Gunderson, Detmer, and Deloitte, and to many of you. Um, I've, we also are vastly supported by uh, venture capitalists who've been really wonderful um, of contributing both time and financial resources to make this a success. So please join us if you haven't. You will learn something from this next generation and, and expand your network of deal flow. Um, and again, thank you so much. During this uncertain time of COVID-19 that we find ourselves living and working in, I believe that this next award is more relevant than ever. For over three decades, venture capital has been at the forefront of some of the greatest advancements in medicine, pushing the boundaries of medical innovation and spurring the creation of the biotechnology and medical device industries. The Excellence in Healthcare Innovation Award recognizes those who have demonstrated a clear commitment to the advancement of healthcare innovation through their investment in and support of groundbreaking medical companies that are working on treatments and cures for the most deadly and costly diseases. I'm delighted to announce that this year's winner for the Excellence in Healthcare Innovation Award goes to Dr. Jim Healy of Sophie Nova Ventures. Dr. Healy has been financing companies that are developing potentially important therapies that could be transformative for patients. And he's done this at Sophie Nova for over 20 years. He has funded companies where 11 products were approved by the FDA or EMA. 22 of his investments have gone public and 11 have been acquired as private or public companies. He is currently a member of the board of directors of at least nine such innovative companies and an investor in many others. It's my pleasure and honor to recognize Jim, a former board member of the NVCA for this great award. Congratulations. It came as a complete surprise to me to learn that I'd received the NVCA Excellence in Healthcare Innovation Award. It's an honor to be recognized alongside talented colleagues who received this award in prior years. I grew up in Montana, raised by a hardworking single mother. I came to California to attend college at UC Berkeley and stayed in the Bay Area to receive both my graduate degree and medical degree from Stanford. When I first arrived in California, I could have never imagined the path my career has taken or the road that led me here today. In the 20 years that I've been at Sofanova, our team has partnered with exceptional entrepreneurs to bring 30 new and innovative drugs to patients in need. These new medications include drugs that can change the lives or save the lives of patients with rare genetic disorders, life-threatening cancers, or a large set of Americans who suffer from heart disease. I can't tell you how gratifying it is to see Sofanova's investments turn in to drugs that have a positive impact on the lives of patients. I'd like to thank my thesis advisor for training me to think critically as a scientist. I'd like to thank the team at Sofanova for always putting patient impact at the forefront of every investment decision. On behalf of all of us at Sofanova, we would like to thank our limited partners for their support. Without their support, we couldn't do what we do. And last and most importantly, we'd like to thank my family who has supported me over the years in what can be a demanding and challenging career. I'd also like to thank the NVCA for their ongoing support and leadership of the innovation ecosystem. Thank you, Bobby, the NVCA team and the board for giving the Morgan Stanley VCPE team the opportunity to present the Rising Stars Award. We have been fortunate to have assisted many of the members on this call with the custody, sale and distribution of their public holdings for over 15 years. Many of these VCs came from modest beginnings before investing in and mentoring some of the largest, most widely respected public companies today. The rising stars being recognized today, like those that came before them, are accomplished individuals in their, in their own right and are on track to be leaders in the VC community for years to come. And without further ado, the winners are...
The first recipient of the 2021 NVCA Rising Star Award goes to Brent Baltimore. Brent is a principal at Graycroft and a member of VLCKVC, which is a nonprofit aimed at doubling the representation of Black investors by 2024. He is also a member of the Class 25 Kaufman Fellows. Brent has led many of Graycroft's investments in enterprise software, including security, data animation, and micro SaaS companies. Some of those include Mapped, Agni, Craft, and Smart. He also leads Graycroft's investment thesis in security and access control, which has resulted in their investment in OpenPath, which is a company that helps others open their office spaces in a touchless, frictionless way. OpenPath's importance has been highlighted during the pandemic. A particular note, Brent is responsible for spearheading Graycroft's initiative to further integrate data science and machine learning into the investment process. Congratulations on this accomplishment, Brent. It is an honor to be considered a rising star in the venture capital landscape. Congratulations to my fellow honorees and to everyone being honored tonight for their contributions to the space. You know, our role in the technology ecosystem is to support the brazen individuals that are building the technologies that move our world forward. It is a privileged position. I'm so excited and grateful to have a front row seat to what the brightest minds are building. Thanks so much to the NVCA, to my colleagues at Graycroft, thank you for your mentorship, and to my peers across the space, thank you for your partnership. Lastly, to my family, thank you so much for your unwavering support. I'm so excited to accept this award. Thank you. Our second Rising Stars recipient is Dr. Dan Gebermedden. Dan is a partner at Flare Capital Partners and has been a relentless champion of investing in breakthrough health technology and services companies that will lower the cost and improve the quality of healthcare. A number of Dan's investments, including Somatis, are on the verge of breaking out and have seen significant markups or exits. As a physician and former entrepreneur, Dan brings a unique perspective and ability to provide real value add to entrepreneurs. In addition, he has act also acted as senior health policy advisor to Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker and Congressman Joseph Kennedy III and Jake Auchincloss. Finally, he worked to expand healthcare infrastructure in the developing world, serving as a consultant for the Clinton Foundation Health Access Initiative in Ethiopia. Congratulations, Dan. First off, I want to say thank you to the NBCA and the nominating committee for this great honor. Uh, thanks to my partners, Michael and Bill. Appreciate you guys taking a chance on a doctor, uh, former entrepreneur, health plan operator who never really thought about a career in venture capital. I want to say thank you to the rest of the investment team at Flare Capital, Adam, Vic, Ian, Parth, Margaret, uh, our admin staff, Lauren, Taylor. Uh, VC really is a team sport. I don't do any of the work I do alone, so very grateful for all of your contributions and your support. Uh, thanks to our current and former executive partners, uh, Gary Gottlieb, Chris Kreider, Phyllis Gottlieb, Bob Sheehy, Chris Hosovar. All of you have been extremely gracious with your time and supportive in my development. Uh, thanks to the several limited partners in the Flare Capital Funds. Uh, really appreciate your partnership and trust in what we do. Uh, perhaps most importantly, I want to say thank you to the CEOs and the co-founders of the companies I've had the privilege of backing, uh, Ken Okazi and Tony Walters at Somatis. Matt McCambridge and Scott Sansovich at Eden Health, uh, Seth Fierstein at WeHealth, uh, and Carolyn McGill at Atheon. Uh, you're the reason I'm receiving this award. Most of what I try to do is just partner uh, with the best mission-driven entrepreneurs tackling some of the biggest problems uh, in healthcare. Thanks to my peers, my co-investors, my collaborators in our industry of healthcare venture capital. We've seen a blossoming over the last five years, and it's been great to be alongside you to, to witness that, to share stories. It's the camaraderie that I really value uh, in our industry. Uh, thanks to my parents and extended family who are likely watching this. Uh, thanks for being great cheerleaders and sounding boards as, I, as I've navigated a non-traditional career. And finally, in my application for the Rising Star Award, I wrote a lot about elevating the presence of individuals from diverse backgrounds uh, in venture capital investing roles as well as in operating roles and elevating the voice of clinicians uh, and making key business decisions as we innovate our healthcare system. Hopefully, some of the investments that I've made are a testament to the power and potential success of that approach. We'll take this award as a sign to continue all of the important work that we're doing to improve our healthcare system by partnering with world-class teams 
and delivering innovative solutions to populations who desperately need them. Thank you. The next recipient of the MBCA 2021 Rising Star Award goes to Katherine Weinman. Katherine is an emerging leader at Norwest. She's a deal execution machine in helping drive some of Norwest's top performing investments, including Memphis Meats and Senrev. She joined Norwest as an intern in 2017 while getting her MBA at Stanford and later joined full time as an associate in 2018. To date, she has sourced 40 million in investments. While getting her MBA from Stanford, she led the High Tech Club, which connects students with educational and career opportunities in tech. Outside of work, Catherine serves as a board member of the Emerging Venture Capitalists Association and as a co-chair of the Technology Advisory Council at Mission Asset Fund. Congratulations, Catherine. I grew up in Texas and I've been home a lot amid COVID. I find that I'm getting a lot of questions about the nuts and bolts of how venture actually works. And in answering them, I end up just sharing a whole bunch about why it is that I love my job. For one, there's no one right way to do venture. We're all trying to find our own blend of strategy, hustle, and a little bit of luck. Secondly, we get to spend time with brilliant founders dedicating 10 plus years of their lives to some crazy mission to impact the world. And then third, we have such a privileged platform to invest in the world the way we want it to be. Never has that hit me more directly than with our investment in Memphis Meats. It was pretty clear that conventional production can't keep up with global demand, but the concept of bringing the same product to the table in a completely different way is a pretty audacious goal. But for me, it was very much a reminder of why I wanted to do venture in the first place. It's a huge honor to be recognized by the NBCA, especially since just a few years ago, venture capital was a bit of a black box to me. I wanna give a special thanks to Jeff Crow, Parker Burrell, and the entire Norwest family for welcoming me into the venture community. We're truly honored to join the NBCA this year in celebrating and saluting the venture industry. At EY, we feel strongly about supporting the innovation ecosystem. One way we do this is through our Entrepreneur of the Year program, which celebrates the most ambitious leaders who are building successful businesses around the world, many of which have been backed by the venture industry. The NBCA believes, as we do, that when the innovation ecosystem is enabled and empowered, we can build a better working world. Our commitment to the venture industry goes all the way back to the founding of Silicon Valley. This heritage continues today as we advise and guide entrepreneurs from tech giants to its newest disruptors. We look forward to continuing to empower the next generation of companies that will fuel the economy of tomorrow with the NBCA and you, its members. It is now my distinct honor to present the 2021 NBCA Firm of the Year Award to Sequoia Capital. Congratulations on this outstanding achievement. Thank you, NVCA, for this wonderful recognition. We greatly appreciate all the work you do in public policy to support innovation here in the United States. It's an honor for us to work alongside the NVCA to empower the next generation of entrepreneurs. This achievement would not have been possible without the hard work of founders, the support of limited partners, most of which are nonprofit institutions, and the commitment to all our Sequoia colleagues. Thank you to everyone involved. For nearly five decades, we have partnered with outlier founders as early as possible. Our goal is to help the daring build legendary companies. We'd love to partner with founders for their entire journey from idea to IPO and beyond. And we work together as a team to help each of our companies to succeed. This past year in 2020 was a difficult one. We at Sequoia had to quickly figure out how to best help founders navigate the global crisis. We were so impressed with the resiliency we saw across the entrepreneurial community in the wake of the pandemic. Founders and their companies innovated to respond and to adapt to the new reality. It was truly inspiring to see, and we're incredibly optimistic about the opportunity for startups in the future. We're also grateful to the NVCA for your work to support founders and to assist our ecosystem during this difficult time. On behalf of all of us at Sequoia Capital, we thank the NVCA for this wonderful honor. We're incredibly flattered and deeply humbled. 
We wish you all a terrific and a healthy 2021. Congratulations to the team at Sequoia Capital for winning the Firm of the Year Award. I'm Todd Spies and I run venture capital coverage at Citigroup. City Ventures has been a longstanding member of the NVCA and I'm proud to bring in Citigroup as a sponsor. I'm here to present the Lifetime Achievement Award. You all know this year's recipient as a former board member and chairman of the NVCA. He is a 35 year veteran of the venture capital industry. He is the co-founder of DCM Ventures and his investing track record landed him on the Forbes Midas list for four consecutive years. Without further ado, this year's recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award is Dixon Dull. Congratulations, Dixon, and thank you for all you've done for the venture capital industry. Hey, Dad, it's me, Alex. Normally, I'd be sitting in the front row with bells and whistles uh, for your celebration, but uh, for just a bit longer, this is what we get to do to celebrate your Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, as your son, you already had won my Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, you taught me so many life lessons, the most rewarding of which usually came with uh, words from you. Uh, I'm, I'm so proud of you. When I started my own venture firm at 1011 Ventures, I took a lot of the lessons uh, that you had shown uh, on building a successful career in venture. Uh, I borrowed your phrase, the industry's first fund to focus solely on as, as you did with Axel Telecom and we did at 1011 with cybersecurity. Uh, we also took the opportunity to look for global investments, uh, just like you had done with DCM and your golden triangle strategy and uh, augmenting your Silicon Valley capabilities into new places like China. Uh, and we even joined the NVCA right upon our first closing of our fund in 2015. One of the first things we did was uh, sign up for an NVA, NVCA membership, because I, I know a lot of the people that you all really respect in the industry were always involved and, and, and took an active care uh, with the organization. Um, I know one of your proudest accomplishments with the NVCA was during your time as chairman, uh, when you and Bobby were able to really help shape the Obama administration's passing of the JOBS Act. Uh, you were able to really successfully marry something you've always been passionate about and the role of the entrepreneurial economy uh, and ecosystem and its importance to the overall uh, economy. Uh, that was a, a great success uh, for the industry and I think uh, something we're all thankful that, that you were able to do and I, I know how proud you are of that accomplishment. Your most important lessons inevitably revolved around the importance of quality people. And uh, I, I see it now in the literally thousands of conversations I've had over the years where someone will come up to me and say, hey, I know your dad. I worked with your dad on this. Uh, they usually then get a big smile on their face and say something funny that you said to them or, you know, a great time that, that you had in, in pursuing something. Uh, and then it always ends with, he helped me with this, or he was great to work with. So, Dad, uh, let me tell you how proud I am of you, um, and thanks for all of your lessons. Uh, congratulations on, on winning the NVCA's Lifetime Achievement Award. I'm deeply honored and privileged to be with you today, and grateful for this award you've given me. I also want to acknowledge my family, especially my wife, Carol. Thank you to my early mentors, other past recipients, and the many brilliant entrepreneurs of whom I've had the privilege of working. A great deal of gratitude goes to the NBCA for preserving these award-granting functions, even though this one must be virtual. It's a valued tradition that has served our vital VC industry exceptionally well by rewarding and honoring thought-leading investment professionals and firms. These people and firms have created widely acknowledged, innovative, transformative companies across life sciences, communications, 
cybersecurity, computer architecture, and many other areas. The model we in the U.S. used so successfully has been handed down through generations of firms, the companies and the teams that they create. Additionally, the model has been replicated by many other venture firms in the world. Innovation all across all global um, industries, both old and new, has never been more important. Artificial intelligence properly implemented will disrupt virtually all new innovation areas across most verticals and geographies, as an example. Building extraordinary teams always has been and will continue to be difficult, but it's a critical success factor for leading VC firms. Great VCs, why are they great? They attempt to pick extraordinary partners and investors, hopefully compatible, as is well known, they attempt to create exceptional uh, entrepreneurial teams. To those of you either contemplating or already early on in your uh, career as a VC, I'm proud to tell you that it's the most intellectually stimulating, fun, and rewarding job, quote unquote, that any young person can have. You will meet so many unbelievably interesting people. You'll develop uh, personal and professional relationships, some of which can or will last a lifetime. Since the industry has become so global, you'll have the opportunity to visit many of the other true innovation capitals around the world when permitted. And if you're wondering whether you should come into VC and want to learn about it, go get an offer as an associate and learn the tricks of the trade. I've spent time on six of the seven comment continents in the uh, early uh, and middle points in my career. I consider many of my venture industry friendships to be extremely interesting, diverse, and valuable. You will meet and can easily benefit from having friends in the diverse global innovation ecosystem. We live in a global world and the VC space provides global opportunity as never before. We need people with global perspectives and expansive reach. I humbly pass the baton on to you. Wow, what an incredible group of award winners this year. You should all be very proud of your accomplishments and know that the industry is eagerly waiting to see what you will do next to further our innovative ecosystem. That concludes the awards programming for this year's NDCA Awards Virtual Ceremony. Thank you all for joining and please take care.